Hello and welcome to my talk about the online simple knapsack problem with reservation costs. This was a joint work between ETH Zurich and RWTH Aachen University with my co-authors Hans-Joachim Bökenhauer, Elisabeth Bourgeons, Jorai Rokovic and Peter Rosmanit. My name is Henry Lotze. Before we start, I would like to quickly recap the definition of the knapsack problem, the simple knapsack problem, as well as the online simple knapsack problem. If you recall, the knapsack problem is concerned with having a knapsack of fixed capacity as well as items, each with a weight and a utility. And your job is to pack the knapsack with these items such that the utility is maximized and the capacity is not exceeded. The simple knapsack problem, as the name already suggests, is a bit simpler in its setting, in that each item's weight is equal to its utility. And now the problem is to fill up the knapsack with items by as much as possible. In this setting, we can normalize the size of the knapsack to 1. In the online simple knapsack problem, we have a further restriction, in that we do not know the instance in advance and are only revealed the items one by one. We do not know the sizes of these items in advance and we do not know how many items we can expect. But we still have to decide whenever an item is presented whether we want to pack it or whether we want to finally reject it. We cannot take back any of these decisions. For so, for example, if we have an online algorithm and we have this first item, then an online algorithm can finally decide that it wants to pack it into its knapsack. As well, maybe for further items here, and maybe we get to a point here where we are presented a single item that we do not want to pack into the knapsack, so we discard it permanently. And then the last item of the instance is presented and it does not fit into the knapsack, so our algorithm was able to pack this much. So the first question is, how do we measure the performance of such an algorithm? And the short answer is that uh, we ask how good this instance could be solved if you knew the instance in advance. That is by an optimal offline algorithm. And then we compare the sizes of the packed knapsacks against one another. So this instance can be optimally packed if we do not pack these two small items. You can completely fill it up to a size of one. Now, the ratio between this optimal algorithm would be the size of this knapsack, 1, divided by the size of the knapsack of the algorithm, which, sheets, which seems to be a bit bigger than 1 half. If we do this calculation over all possible instances, always compare the optimal packing against the packing of the algorithm, and then take um, the biggest of these ratios, this is called the competitive ratio. And if you're familiar with online computation, then you may already know that this ratio for this problem of all instances is not constantly bounded. This was already shown in 1995 by Marchetti, Sparkamella and Vercellis. And it basically says the thing that I just said, there is no deterministic online algorithm that has a constant bounded competitive ratio for this problem. And the uh, proof for this is actually quite simple and I can repeat it here quickly. So we have the same setting as before. The knapsacks are drawn a bit smaller but they're exactly the same and we introduce some epsilon bigger than zero. Now we present as a first item an epsilon and the whole idea of this proof is that with two instances have the same prefix then a deterministic online algorithm has to decide the same on this prefix. So every algorithm either uh, discards this item or packs this item. So let's look at algorithms that would pack this item. Now the adversary of course knows this and the rest of the instance would be an element of size one, which would be packed into the knapsack of the optimal on offline algorithm, but this cannot be packed by our online algorithm. So the ratio would be what the opt was able to pack, one, and what arc was able to pack, which is epsilon, so one over epsilon. And since we can make epsilon as small as we want, we cannot bound this ratio by any constant. So what happens if we look at the algorithms that would reject this epsilon? All right, so they do not pack this epsilon into the knapsack. So the adversary knows this and the instance simply ends. The instance only consists of this epsilon. So the online algorithm now has nothing in its knapsack, but the optimal offline algorithm, of course, packs this epsilon into its knapsack. Again, we would compare the fillage of the optimal offline algorithm against that of the online algorithm, and this isn't even bounded. So it's, it's sort of infinite because we're dividing by zero here. And this already was the whole proof. So let's introduce some notation. I've already informally told you what the competitive ratio of an algorithm A is. It's, it's rho of A, and we will call this in our paper gain of opt divided by gain of A. 
And the gain of opt will always simply be whatever the optimal algorithm is able to pack into its knapsack. While the gain of an algorithm will be what the algorithm can pack into its knapsack minus some possible reservation costs. And these reservation costs, which I will introduce in a second, will be dependent on a factor of alpha, which, are, which is a proportion of an item that we will have to pay as reservation. So what is the deal with these reservations? Well, we basically extended this basic decision model of either packing or rejecting by a third option. And this third option is reserving items. So you could imagine that we now have a third bucket of infinite size or knapsack of infinite size, you could call it, for example, a reservation depot, into which we can now uh, preliminarily pack items of which we are not sure if we want to pack them finally or not. So let's just apply this to uh, the example that we just had, the two examples. For ex uh, both start with the Nepsilon and we know that accepting or rejecting this item both are very bad options. So our third option cannot be worse, so we simply reserve this item. And if this was the complete instance, then now we have the option to just put this item that we put previously into our reserve into our knapsack. We can now pack it. And the optimum would, of course, also pack this epsilon. But I've already hinted at it. This is not for free. Every item that's put into the reservation has to be paid for in the end. And it has to be paid for a proportion of the item. That is some alpha times this item. And it doesn't matter whether we use this item in the end or not. As soon as we pay, put it into the, our reservation depot, we have to pay for it in the end. So our gain is not this whole green area, but only the remainder of this after we have subtracted this alpha times epsilon. And for the sake of completion, we also look at the other example where the instance starts with epsilon, but there's a one leading up. As, I, as we already know, we have a deterministic algorithm, so it would again reserve this epsilon. And then this item of size one is presented, and then our online algorithm can simply pack this one into its knapsack, opt would do the same. But we, of course, as I already mentioned, have to pay for items even if we don't use them. So we still have this um, cost of alpha times epsilon. So before we go into our results, I want to quickly go over the related work for this problem. Um, this is just a selection of papers which, in our opinion, fit best to what we are doing. This is by no means a complete collection. And it starts by the paper Removable Online Knapsack Problems by Iwama and Takitomi from 2002. And they looked at a model where they have a knapsack and they are able to remove items um, during the being presented new items. Of course, they are not able to return these removed items into the knapsack at a later point. This was extended by Han et al. in 2014 in the paper Online Unweighted Knapsack Problem with Removal Cost, in which the authors looked at uh, the scenario where you have to pay for removing items from the knapsack, which was previously free in the 2002 paper. Then there is the Online Knapsack Problem Advice and Randomization by Birkenhauer et al. from 2014, in which the authors looked at the case of um, playing with this determinism of the algorithms. So the online knapsack problem seems to be bad because it's deterministic. So the question was, um, can we improve it if we allow it to access some random bits or do some coin flips is what informally is usually said. And they also looked at so-called advice bits, but we will not uh, go into detail about these right now, but it turned out that allowing for just a single bit of randomization allows for a two competitive algorithm. Then finally, there's the 2019 paper Online Knapsack Problems with a Resource Buffer by Han et al. And this is most close to what we are doing, but it's not reducible to a model, not in the one way or the other. And Han et al. look at a model where they also have sort of a depot, but it's of finite size, finite fixed size. And they are able to move items from this resource buffer into the knapsack for free. All right. so. So much for the related work. Now we look at our results and the results could be dependent on the re, um, reservation costs. So we plotted the competitive ratio against the reservation costs between zero and one. We cut off the area bigger than 0 0.8 because it's diverges towards infinity uh, when it converges to one. 
And as you can see, this is, these are quite interesting results, and as in that we have different functions for different reservation values. First of all, we have this first area between 0 and 1 over 6. And the interesting thing is, as soon as you have any reservation costs, no matter how small they are, you are already too competitive and cannot become better anymore. Then there's this area right here in the gray, which we weren't able to close when handing in the paper. Uh, which is upper bounded by 2 plus alpha, lower bounded here by 2, and there are some different functions here. Then we have this tight area beyond square root of 2 minus 1, which is around 0 0.41, which is 2 plus alpha competitive, so it's linear. And at the golden ratio minus 1, which is around 0 0.61, the, we are also tight, but with a different function of 1 divided by 1 minus alpha. And since handing in this paper, one of our colleagues from ETH Zurich, Fabian Frey, had a further more thorough look at this area. And while the proofs are not complete yet, we have a theory on how the complete picture could look like. And it should look like this, although the proofs are not complete yet. So the, the, the area of two competitiveness extends towards the point of 0 0.25. And then it grows non-linearly, although it looks lin linearly, it's not linear, to the point of square root of 2 minus 1 and then extends as before. So we have three non-differentiable points in this, um, in this competitive ratio plotted against the reservation costs, which was already quite uh, surprising when we found out these results. All right. So for the structure of the rest of the talk, I want to first introduce uh, one lower and one upper bound to you. So um, the first one will handle this area between 0 and 1 over 6. So basically answer the question, why is this lower bounded by a factor of 2? And the upper bound will deal with the area between 0 and the golden ratio minus 1 and will show an algorithm that is 2 plus alpha competitive, so linearly competitive. Then I will talk a bit about the case of non-rejecting algorithms. I haven't defined these yet. I will do so when we get there. Um, these are interesting because they, uh, obtain, they, they, they yield a quite an unexpected behavior. They, they sort of counter uh, an intuition. Then I will quickly go over the scenario of reservation that we have introduced against randomization and advice. Does it help or not if we also have reservation on top of randomization and advice? And then we'll quickly talk about possible future applications of a model or related models and then conclude the talk. So let's talk, start with the lower bound. And as I already announced, this is a lower bound of two for alpha smaller than one over six. And we have a familiar picture of the two knapsacks of our online algorithm, the optimal offline algorithm and our reservation depot. And the instance starts by presenting an item of one half plus delta for some very small value of delta. Now, every algorithm has three options now. It can pack this item, it can reject this item, or it can reserve this item. And we simply go over all options here. So let's assume that an algorithm would pack this item. All right? So now it's in the knapsack. So the next item would be an item of size one. And well, the optimal offline algorithm would uh, just put this item into its knapsack, the instance ends, and now we have a competitive ratio of 1 divided by 1 over 2 plus uh, delta, which is uh, bigger than, uh, which converges to 2. Um, the second option, of course, is to reject the item. But as we have already seen before with the small epsilon that was rejected, this just means that the instance ends, opt can pick this item into its, uh, for its knapsack, we have nothing as the online algorithm and our bound is unbounded and it's definitely bigger than two. So let's go for the third option, maybe we can get below two there. So we reserve this item and now the next item is presented, which is one half minus delta squared. These two items do not quite fit together into, the, into a knapsack. They are together slightly bigger than one. So again, we have three options. Do we pack this item, reject it, or do we reserve it? And assuming that we would pack it, now we have the same scenario as before, an item of size one is presented, opt will pick this item, we will have only one half divided by delta squared in our knapsack, we also have to pay reservation costs, so we're definitely worse than two competitive in this place. 
So packing is not the right option here. What about rejecting the item? I mean, now we have something in our reserve, so we are not completely screwed if this is the end of the instance. But the thing is that we have now completely rejected this item and we cannot take it back at a later point. So the adversary will simply present an, a matching item for this, such that the sum of these two items is exactly one. And we cannot pick this item, but we of course could pick this item. And now the instance ends. So the best that we can do is pick the bigger one of the two that we have available, this one and this one. We would pick this one because this is a, big, a little bit bigger. And of course the optimal offline algorithm would pick these two items for its knapsack. And again, we have to pay reservation costs and our bound is bigger than two. So we would reserve this item and this game would go on. And to give you a picture of the decision tree or a sketch of the decision tree rather, it looks like this. If you're interested, you could pause the video at this point. But the main idea is that we got to this point and we looked at the reject and take option. And the next item that would be presented would be delta cubed. And the next items would basically just count out up this exponent and then repeat the same game in the reject and take case. All right, so much for the lower bound. Now let's look at an upper bound for this area between zero and the golden ratio minus one. And now it's the same picture as before, but we've drawn in this little bound right here. And it's one divided by two plus alpha. This is an important bound for our algorithm because it tells us basically when we are done with, a, with the algorithm. So for this demonstration, it's not really necessary how big these items are exactly. So I haven't labeled them here and it's not really important. It's only important relative to this bound. And our algorithm will always do the same now. It will look at a new item whenever a new item arrives and then ask the question, if I would pack this item into my knapsack and pack everything that's in my reservation currently also into the knapsack and then subtract the costs that I would have to pay for the reservation, does this sum exceed this bound of one divided by two plus alpha? So applied to this first item, this would just mean well, I'll simulate pu putting it into the knapsack. I don't have anything reserved. And so I can just ask, is this item itself smaller, uh, smaller equal than this bound? It is. And if it is, then I decide just to reserve this item. So it goes into my reservation knapsack. And now the next item is presented and we repeat this game. Is everything that we have reserved so far minus the cost of it? This is this minus alpha um, plus the new item bigger than this bound already and it isn't it's exactly on this bound but it does not exceed it so we reserve this item once again and now maybe a third item is presented and the question is asked again everything that we've reserved so far minus the cost plus the new item does it exceed the bound yes it does it even exceeds the bound of the knapsack and now our algorithm does the following now it has available everything in the reservation and the new item and it tries to pack the knapsack optimally using these items. So for what we are given, this would be this newest biggest item, the last one that we are presented and the, this upper one from the knapsack. And of course we would have to subtract the reservation costs. And now our algorithm stops. It does not look at the rest of the instance. And it, the adversary could present an item that it fits exactly this remaining gap, our algorithm wouldn't care. So what the adversary can do is of course uh, provide the rest of the instance such that opt can optimally pack a knapsack of size one. And for example, it, matches, it presents a matching item to the first item. It could also just present an item of size one. But opt can definitely pack this item into its knapsack and have an, and we have a competitive ratio of one divided by whatever we have in this knapsack. And what I haven't proven here is that this strategy will always ensure that the gain that we get from the strategy will be at least one divided by two plus alpha, thus giving us our upper bound. And the general theme of our paper is that the algorithms that we are presenting are all nice and simple. They are easy to understand, they are easy to implement. And the hard part of this paper is in, in the analysis of these algorithms. It's more involved to actually show that these provide the upper bounds that we have proven. All right, 
So now let's go over these non-rejecting algorithms, which I've already announced. So as we already know, we have three options with, when, with our online algorithm. We can pack an item, we can reject an item, and we can reserve an item. So what happens if we maybe hinder the algorithm a bit more by removing the reject option and replacing it by the option, if you want to reject any item, you have to reject the complete rest of the instance. And this sounds quite dramatic at first. So, okay, maybe not for small alpha, right? Because we have very, very small reservation costs. Well, everything that we want to reject, we'll just reserve it. It's fine, right? It shouldn't be too bad because reserving doesn't cost much and we should be done quite soon anyway. But on the other hand, for very high reservation costs, this means that we're not really able to reject any items anymore. So what do we do if we are presented items that we do not really want to handle, that we don't really want to pack or reserve? then maybe our competitive ratio becomes much worse in this point, right? And it turns out that both of these intuitions are wrong. First of all, we look at the one that's not so dramatic, but maybe still surprising, that we have, namely that we have a gap of alpha for this whole area at the front here, if we are unable to reject items. And this will probably extend further to, um, to 0 0.25, if the new results are correct. But the more interesting result is this last area, because the algorithms that tightly match this lower bound are non-rejecting algorithms. They are unable to reject items. This is actually the best possible thing that you can do using a non-rejecting algorithm. Of course, you could also use a rejecting algorithm, but you do not have to, to, be, to get the best possible competitive ratio. And this was really surprising to us because of this intuition that I just told you, that we thought, surely, if you're unable to reject items, this should cost you something. And it really doesn't, if you are beyond this point of around 0 0.41, this square root of minus one. All right. Next, uh, before we go to the outlook and the conclusion, I want to quickly talk about the relation between reservation, randomization, and advice. I've already mentioned that randomized on algorithms are able to flip some coins and they enhance their bounds doing so. And they can also be given advice bits, which further uh, enhance their bounds, but we will not go into detail or the definitions of advice here. But the interesting point to take away here, if you're familiar with these topics, is that using reservations on this particular problem does not improve the randomized or the advice bounds. And this was also surprising to us because we thought if you're making this algorithm quite a bit more mightier, giving it a third option to just pay a bit for an item and then later pack it, then this could also improve these other bounds. But it turns out that this behaves sort of parallel to, to one another, this reservation and the randomization or reservation and advice. It does not improve any of the bounds. And would really be interesting for us if this is also true for other problems, but because we do not know this yet. So, Let's look at possible further applications of this reservation model. Of course, I've just talked about this model where we pay for every item that we put into our reservation, regardless of whether we use it or not. It could also be interesting to only pay for the items that we do not use in the end, so that we are sort of lending something and if we're actually using it, then we don't have to pay for it, but if we're not using it, then we have to pay for it. And of course, you could also look at other problems with the model that we have presented in this talk. For example, online call admissions or graph embedding problems, which are both very similar in that you have a host graph and want to embed other graphs into this host graph. And you could delay the decision on where to embed them for by paying some cost that you could uh, set up arbitrarily. And you could, of course, also look at secretary problems and reserve secretaries. But of course, at this point, you should probably uh, limit the number of reservations that you're able to do. All right, so to wrap up the talk, um, I'm going to give you a conclusion. And first of all, we have seen this new model of reservations. And the interesting thing about it is that depending on our competitive ratio, we have different um, behaviors of the growth of the competitive ratio. We have these three non-differentiable points with different functions types in between there, linear and non-linear functions in there, and even a constant function. And we have this flip between having to reject items and not having to reject items anymore, for which we're not exactly sure why it's, it's happening at, at a specific point. And 
What we have also seen is that there, are, there is no visible connect interaction between reservation and randomization or reservation and advice. And as I've already said, we would be very interested if this is also the case for other problems and also if these behavioral changes are also happening for other problems. And with this, I'll thank you for your attention and have a nice day.